Welcome to Canada's most irreverent talk show. This is the Andrew Lawton Show, brought to you by True North. Yeah. Coming up, China's infiltration of Canadian politics and media, a look ahead at this week's throne speech, and what the heck is up with our criminal justice system. The Andrew Lawton Show starts right now. Good afternoon. Welcome to another edition of The Andrew Lawton Show here on True North, Canada's most irreverent talk show, September 21st, 2020. Yes, just a few months to go until the end of the year, and actually uh, three months to go and a couple of days until Christmas. So if that is something that disturbs you greatly, well, I apologize for nothing. In any case, great to have you tuned into the show here. It is a big week in Canadian politics. The throne speech is coming up on Wednesday. Wednesday. When this show returns on Thursday, we'll of course have a, a full breakdown of all the things that Justin Trudeau has offered to try to desperately cling to power and get the other parties to vote for the Liberals to continue to limp along. And as I said last week, would not be surprised to see universal basic income or some other massively socialist policy or policies in the throne speech just to buy the support of the NDP, which we know does not exactly have the money or energy right now to head into an election. But I'm not going to lay out predictions because if you lay out predictions, you can very easily prove yourself wrong. Suffice it to say, I will be talking about this on the next show. I guess that's a prediction, but one I'm a little bit more in control of. Also going to be talking this show about China's influence campaigns in Canada. And I want to focus on two prongs of this here. Not just China's PR machine, but also the way it seems to be really trying to go after Canadian politicians. We know this is happening. We know it's an ongoing problem. In fact, there have been intelligence and security reports in Canada for years about individual politicians that security officials suspect might be under the thumb of the Chinese regime, or at the very least, efforts about Chinese attempts, Chinese attempts at influencing politicians. So we should be very cautious whenever Chinese politicians start exalting Canadian politicians. And you know, there is one figure in Canadian politics that seems to be just the absolute favorite of the Chinese regime right now, and that is Politburo Patty herself, Canadian Health Minister Patty Haidu, who just when I had started to forget about the Politburo Patty name, right gets renewed again. And th this latest example of this is actually an article in Xinhua, which is the Chinese state media outlet, or one of the many Chinese state media outlets. We'll talk about that shortly. China appreciates Canadian Minister of Health Patty Haidu's objective and fair comments on China's efforts to combat COVID-19, a foreign ministry spokesperson said Friday. The spokesperson Wang Wenbin says China is willing to work with the international community, including Canada, to make positive contributions to containing the pandemic at an early date. Wang had made these comments, Jinhua says, at a press briefing when asked to comment on Haidu's remarks in a recent interview, and it was about how Haidu had recognized all of China's efforts in informing the World Health Organization about the novel coronavirus and all of that stuff. So just heaping praise on her for saying what China itself has been saying to people. Let's play that clip of Politburo Patty. In retrospect, do you think that China was honest and was forthcoming in the intelligence it shared with the global community and Canada about the risk? Look, very early on, China alerted the World Health Organization to the emergence of a novel coronavirus and, and, and also shared the sequencing of the gene, which allowed countries to be able to rapidly produce tests to detect it in their, in their own countries. You know, there was a remarkably honest headline about Haidu's comments in Global News where they said, Health Minister continues defense of China's handling of coronavirus case data. And whether it was intentionally critical or perhaps the intention was even laudatory, who knows? But I do find it interesting that that's the narrative she's set out, that she's continuing to defend, as in this has been a recurring thing for her just always, all the time, anytime she's given the opportunity, talk about how great China's handling of this has been. Now, 
remember, China itself has constantly revised its numbers, reneged on some numbers. They've adjusted their calculations. So China itself has said that China's numbers are wrong at various points. And it is particularly telling that Patty Haidu has more confidence in China's early numbers than even China does, because she was actually trumpeting this even before China had said, ah, you know, on second thought, maybe we got things a little bit wrong here. So she's been a constant. She's been a more stalwart defender of China's coronavirus data than China itself has been. And this is something that we need to take stock of because Patty Haidu has been praised repeatedly by the Chinese regime. It isn't just this latest, uh, you know, accolade from the Chinese foreign ministry, but previously you may remember there was that uh, heaping of praise she got from a China Daily European Union bureau chief who had said that, you know, she is a model, uh, she's a role model to all and, you know, it's the journalists that are asking questions about this that are the problem. And we talked about that back on the show, I think it was somewhat in like April or May. That's how long this has been going on. And you may remember the catalyst to that was when Patty Haidu had accused a reporter who asked a pretty reasonable question of feeding conspiracies for daring to question China. This is that clip. There's no indication that the data that came out of China uh, in terms of their infection rate and their death rate uh, was falsified in any way. In fact, uh, if you look at the death rate uh, overall in China, it's much higher than the one we're seeing now. Um, and so we, we rely on the World Health Organization to do this important work because, of course, we're all in this together. And I think one of the most important things to understand about this pandemic, this global pandemic, is that as long as coronavirus exists in one country, it exists in all of our countries that we actually have to work collectively as a world now to defeat this virus, to find better ways to treat and then eventually prevent this virus through vaccination or other kinds of methods. And that's going to take everybody working together. And Sorry, please let her finish. No. Ian. So... I would say that your question is feeding into the conspiracy theories that many people have been perpetuating on the on the internet. And it's important to remember that there is no way to beat a global pandemic if we're actually not willing to work together as a globe. We will have to come up with a global solution to this virus. No country is an island. And I am so proud of the Canadian researchers that are part of the World Health Organization Solidarity Project that are working on developing vaccines and treatments for this virus um, that uh, undoubtedly are going to be a big part of the solution about how we all get ourselves out of the situation. So why is this important? It's significant because we're talking about a regime that has no fundamental respect for truth or honesty. Just coincidentally, I was going to be talking about this anyway based on that Xinhua piece about Patty Haidu, but coincidentally, there was a story that came out on ABC, which is the Australia ABC, not the American ABC, this past weekend about the former Beijing bureau chief for ABC, who was actually detained alongside his 14-year-old daughter and threatened with prosecution after the Chinese Politburo raised issues that they had with his coverage of China, of the treatment of the Igars, the treatment of any number of human rights issues in China. And this was something that, again, I, I can't summarize the entirety of it because there was a lot of nuance to the story. I would encourage you to take a look yourself at abc.net.au. But it's a story by Matthew Carney, who writes of how his telephone rang and he was summoned to a meeting with the Politburo where they had printed out copies of his stories and they continued to get more and more angry as they read through his headlines. And this is, by the way, headlines from articles that are not even accessible in China because the Chinese government has blocked access to them, but that's beside the point. And he talks about how the Chinese government was not just spying on him, going through his emails, they had remotely accessed his computer, but actually deliberately making sure he knew that. At one point, they left an email open on his computer as if to say, he theorized anyway, we're looking and we know what you're up to. And what it was is some activist group in the U.S. had CC'd him on an email, which, trust me, if you're in media, you get emails all the time that are unsolicited. So something being in my inbox is very rarely an indication that I even know about it, let alone am I complicit in, you know, whatever it is that's going on. 
But at one point, he and his 14-year-old daughter, who is viewed, they say, as an adult in Chinese law, are summoned. They're threatening her with detention to take her away from the father. And, I mean, this is the price you pay if you take a, a Beijing posting. I could not imagine... If I had a fam, I mean, I couldn't imagine moving to China anyway for work, but I certainly couldn't imagine doing so if I, I had a family, although, you know, every family has to make the decisions that are right for them. But ultimately, this is what was happening, and, and this is all par for the course. This is quite a, a commonplace turn of events in China. And, you know, I remember talking to a, a former Canadian lawmaker, well, actually a current Canadian lawmaker, who in the previous Conservative government had done a, a trip to China of some kind as a, a member of Parliament. And they were telling me that one of the standard protocols when you go to China is you leave your phone at home and you take a burner because the second you get off the plane at the airport, your phone's being scanned and all of a sudden your data are not your own. So this is something that we all just accept with China and we all take for granted. And we know China is involved in dominance. They're involved in influence campaigns, intelligence campaigns, and they are becoming the new global superpower if they aren't already. So when they start, they as a country that are ostensibly an enemy of freedom and an enemy of Canada, when they start heaping praise on another country's lawmakers, that other country, in this case Canada, needs to be very wary. What is it they're trying to accomplish? And it's not to say that they can't do this deliberately to stoke concerns. We know that. But they're saying it because they think that the Chinese government's talking points are in some way in alignment with the Canadian government's talking points. And if I'm the Canadian government, I'm thinking, okay, we're doing something wrong if this is who we're attracting as our friend. And, and Paula Bureau Patty has continued this. We're not talking about her just refusing to criticize China, which is what Trudeau has done. He said famously when asked about Chinese numbers, eh, you know, those are questions for a different time. No, we're talking about someone who's deliberately going out of their way to say, yeah, you know, we, we think that, you know, everything's hunky-dory, what they're doing is great, and we are so grateful that China was so forthright with the World Health Organization. Well, yeah, because the China approach and the WHO approach are pretty much in lockstep with one another, and it's the rest of the world that's on the losing end of that alliance. China has, there's no question about it, unleashed this virus on the world. So many of the issues that we have, the issues with lockdowns, the issues with the deaths that we have had, are because China could not keep this contained and was not forthright. So when you have a Canadian health minister who should be more concerned about the health of Canadians than the diplomatic relations between Canada and China, saying that China itself deserves praise, we are desperately, desperately missing any genuine, honest, and authentic leadership in this country. And that's what we have at the top of our health file. And it isn't just politicians. It's the media as well. I'm not a print newspaper subscriber. I read everything online because I, I read so many. But in the print edition of the Globe and Mail on Saturday, so the big Saturday edition of the newspaper, there was a full two-page spread of glowing stories about China. Tree fellers turn into tree lovers. Live streams help produce a mushrooming industry. Shopping centers change with the times. And what's the common thread of all of these things? Well, it is a China Watch series titled All You Need to Know, China Watch. And at the very, very bottom of the page, if you look at a, a photo that was posted by David Lundgren from Reuters, content produced by China Daily and distributed in the Globe and Mail. And another one there, a chain of celestial lights to celebrate inclusiveness. Foreign firms see rosy prospects for services trade. So all of these stories, if you were to look at this, you'd say, oh my goodness, China is a great place. Everyone wants to invest there. They're developing things. They're innovating things. That, that's fantastic. Well, who is China Daily, you might ask? Well, I mentioned Xinhua earlier, which is one of the Chinese state media outlets. China Daily is another one. And specifically, China Daily is owned by the Chinese Politburo itself, by the publicity department of the Chinese Communist Party. So everything that China Daily does is Chinese Communist Party propaganda. Now, this is a, a reason you might say that we should probably take what China Daily publishes with a grain of salt. Well, not the Globe and Mail. Instead, they republish it. 
they republish it. Now, this is an advertorial content. Yes, yeah, so it's advertorial. You pay to put it in there. But this is something that is significantly problematic because, yes, it's disclosed in tiny letters, but they are passing off political propaganda as news. The average reader would flip through this and think that this is just another section of the Globe and Mail. The average reader does not know that China Daily is the pol political and publicity arm of the Chinese Politburo. The average reader does not know this. They see it and think, okay, yeah, the Globe and Mail must have some partnership with a, a Chinese media outlet. And it's not to say that people are stupid. It's to say that the whole point of Chinese government propaganda is that they couch things and conceal things so that it can have the air of legitimacy when people that aren't immersed in this world come across it. And that's why you've got to be so careful that the Canadian government is allowing China Daily, Xinhua, and all of these other outlets uh, access at the expense of independent Canadian media like True North. I said jokingly to one of my colleagues, maybe we should do in the Globe and Mail, whatever it costs, pay to do like a China Watch spread that's all of True North stories on China, which are going to be a heck of a lot more honest and authentic than anything the China Daily is publishing about China. But this is what the stakes are. This is what the stakes are. The Chinese government uh, heaping praise on Canadian politicians, infiltrating Canadian media outlets, and people say, ah, you know, well, it's China, you know, we, they're, they're, the, they're, the, they're the future. Is this really the country we want to be the future? Is this the country we want to be cozying up to? Hell no. When we come back, more of The Andrew Lawton Show. You're tuned in to The Andrew Lawton Show. Welcome back to The Andrew Lawton Show. So this past weekend was a fairly busy one as far as news is concerned. We had the passing of former Canadian Prime Minister John Turner and also the passing of Supreme Court Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg. And neither one is surprising in the grand scheme of things in the sense that they're both, you know, quite elderly. But at the same time, we are talking about two people that in their own way were lions of their respective systems. And I, I did find it interesting and completely unsurprising how the media was completely guns blazing in Canada on Ruth Bader Ginsburg's passing and John Turner's passing, who despite the fact that he was only there for a short period of time as PM, was a very influential figure in Canadian politics more broadly. He was, in many cases, a footnote. Most notably, and I, our friend Ezra Levant pointed this out, when Ruth Bader Ginsburg died, Justin Trudeau was very quick on the uptake with a tweet about how much she'd be missed, and then when John Turner died, it was hours before Justin Trudeau said anything at all about it. And I'm like, okay, yeah, I get that we are able to look globally and, and have feelings about things that happen outside of Canada, but there does seem to be this relentless fascination with American politics much more than Canadian politics and American news much more than Canadian news, even from Canadian media outlets. And I realize that I'm not a protectionist as far as information is concerned, so I'll talk about American politics on the show from time to time, such as right now. But I can also point out the double standards that seem to exist when we're talking about what's relevant to the media. And then again, though, with the segment we talked about uh, prior about the Globe and Mail, maybe uh, make Canadian media is only interested in, you know, getting coverage from outside of Canada now, not just China, but also the U.S. But that's a, a secondary point. Uh, let's talk about the Supreme Court battle, though, because now you have this complete double standard that uh, has been set out by everyone. In 2016, when Barack Obama nominated Merrick Garland for the Supreme Court, the Republicans were saying, oh, you know, hang on, we shouldn't be doing this. We shouldn't be nominating a, a Supreme Court justice in an election year. And now in 2020, the Republicans are like, all right, we've got to nominate a Supreme Court justice, even though it's an election year. And before you say that the Republicans are, are big, dirty hypocrites, the Democrats are just as bad because in 2016, they were saying, oh, come on, we've nominated people to the Supreme Court in election years time and time again. It's no big deal. We got to confirm it. And now the Democrats are saying this is an outrage. How dare you? So no political party, no side, no tribe has a monopoly on being a hypocrite. I, I think that ultimately speaking, 
the Republicans are right to do it now because constitutionally they have the right to do it. And whether it's politically opportune or not, that's something that people can decide at the ballot box. And the political concerns are separate from the is it legal and is it proper concerns. But there is something that I wanted to bring about a discussion of in a Canadian context that ties to Ruth Bader Ginsburg. And that's that Canadians need to learn from the frenzy that exists around the Supreme Court and actually embrace a bit of it. Now, I ended up writing a column about this subject in the National Post in 2018 when Anthony Kennedy had stepped down. And I I said, listen, I mean, right now, the complete global media buzz around who's going to fill the Supreme Court seat is absolutely uh, insane. But in Canada, when Beverly McLaughlin, who was the former chief justice, stepped down, I think most people would have said, who? And McLaughlin, by the way, was one of the more well-known Supreme Court justices. Now that she's gone, how many of you, without Googling it, can say who the Supreme Court of Canada chief justice is? How many of you can name any other justices on the Supreme Court? I follow this stuff. I love this stuff. And I can only name a a small handful of them. I think earlier on, I think I was able to rhyme off three right away. I was able to come up with one more. And then I just completely hit a wall on it. And once I Googled it and I'd be like, oh yeah, that name rings a bell. That name rings a bell. There was one name that I'm convinced I've, I've never heard before in my life. But in Canada, we have no investment as a country in the Supreme Court. We pay no attention to it, and we don't politicize the vacancies. And some people may say that's a a good point. That's a feature of the Canadian system. But I'm going to say it's actually a drawback. Because so much governance now happens from the court and not from the legislatures. On issues like assisted dying, abortion, religious freedom, on whether you can take beer from one province to another, big and small issues in Canada right now are legislated from the bench. That's where the decisions are being made. So it doesn't matter if there's a conservative government in power, if anything substantially conservative is going to get struck down by a bunch of activist Supreme Court justices. And this is something that we saw most notably after 10 years of Stephen Harper being in power. We had 10 years of a conservative government. At one point, six of nine Supreme Court justices were appointed by conservatives. And even then, they were still ruling against religious freedom. Look at Trinity Western. The majority of the justices on the bench when the Trinity Western case was decided were conservative appointments. And still, religious freedom lost. Trinity Western was found to not be allowed to have a law school because they said that the constitutional right was trumped by the desire for inclusion and equality and equity on the part of the Law Society of Ontario. So that's the sort of thing that matters a lot more than this bill or that bill, this tax credit or that tax credit. And I'm not saying elections don't matter. But I'm saying that conservatives put a heck of a lot more emphasis on winning elections than they do on winning the longer term cultural battles. And those battles are on the court. Margaret Thatcher famously said, first you win the argument, then you win the vote. We're, I mean, right, right now, people on the right aren't winning either of them. But when they are, they're not focused on the argument. I mean, let's face it. We need to have a Supreme Court that people understand. And the point that I made in the column is a a partially tongue-in-cheek one, but I I think still valid. How do you have a strict constitutionalist in a country that doesn't have all that strict a constitution? It's difficult, but at the same time, it's still important. And if we want judges that are going to stick to issues of freedom, free speech, religious freedom in particular, freedom of assembly, all of these charter rights, we need to start having a lot more of an emphasis in who gets on the bench. And that means we need to have a lot more emphasis on the political uh, machinations of this. And that's something that is not going to come about unless there's a profound culture shift in Canada wherein people start paying attention to this issue more. And whatever you may think of how uh, hyperpolarized or hyperpartisan the U.S. judicial selection process is, that comes about at least from people caring. In Canada, they don't care. In Canada, no one is paying attention to this, so the 
reality is you could have a, a monumental shift, a seismic shift against what you believe in, and no one would be any the wiser because the Supreme Court operates in those funny red suits in a room far away that isn't really all that relevant to what people like us are talking about and caring about. And this is coming when this week, as a matter of fact, the Supreme Court of Canada is set to hear the carbon tax uh, appeals from Ontario, Saskatchewan, and I believe Alberta as well. So we're going to, again, have another decision coming down from the bench where a Supreme Court decision is going to ultimately be the deciding factor more than what individual provincial legislatures are determining. And I'm of the mind that I go into these things with a very pessimistic view. And it's easy. I'm never disappointed, which is why when the True North case against the federal government during the last election ended up with a, a win in our favor, I was actually quite surprised because I assumed that, oh, it doesn't matter how good your case is. You know, we're, we're never gonna, we're never going to win these things. And I was pleased we did. And we're going to continue to fight our case. We are continuing to fight our case. But the point behind that is that we need to have a solid grounding in our courts, not just the Supreme Court, but most notably the Supreme Court, if we want the issues that we care about to end up in our favor long term. And I think it was a profound failing of Stephen Harper's government that there wasn't more of an emphasis on the institutions like the court and other bodies and commissions for down the road and the Senate as well. And I think that that's something that if Aaron O'Toole is successful and becomes the next prime minister, he needs to take into consideration as well. Yes, it may not get you any votes in the here and now, but if you want to advance and champion conservatism in the long run, you have to do so by thinking of these longer-term institutions like the courts and start thinking of the legacy of these issues, which may not be your personal legacy, but if you care about advancing small-c conservative values, this is where it has to be done. And again, I mean, the stakes are immensely high because right now you've got a liberal government that is going to buy its way into re-election, or that's certainly going to be the effort. I mentioned earlier, we're going to have a throne speech this week in which we're going to see billions and billions and billions of dollars that are spent without any regard for debt or deficit. And a lot of people are going to go along with that. A lot of people are going to buy into that because they don't think government has a fiduciary or ethical or moral responsibility to spend money well. And any belief in that that did exist, I think, has been obliterated to a lot of people in the midst of the pandemic. Because that's the narrative that Justin Trudeau has been selling. That, well, you know what, it's times are bad, so we've got to spend. And when times were good, I've pointed this out in the past, he said, well, we can spend now because we can afford to spend. So the liberals have already put their cards on the table. It's always the time to spend. People need to say no. People need to push back against that. And that's what I hope comes in the response to the throne speech on Wednesday. Because again, I've already just completely uh, kissed away the possibility that there's not going to be just a, a spend, spend, spend budget and throne speech that's coming here. We know it's going to be all of those things. So let's not delude ourselves into thinking otherwise. Now, the interesting thing is, just as an aside, this is the first uh, throne speech that Julie Payette, the governor general, will have to deliver uh, after all of these stories that have come about about her not actually liking her job and not liking people and, uh, you know, all of the people that apparently have had to, like, memorize the planets in front of her to rhyme them off on command. So that may be actually the uh, delay, the throne speech as of when I'm recording this, doesn't actually have a, a fixed time yet. So I'm wondering if someone's actually trying to find her to, uh, you know, actually ask her if she wants to do it, or, or maybe they found her and she hasn't agreed yet. Or uh, <laughs> my colleague uh, Candace Malcolm pointed out, you know, perhaps it's different. Perhaps uh, no one in the prime minister's office, like ever, uh, everyone's too afraid to ask her if she can do the throne speech on Wednesday. So she's just like, you know, uh, ha hanging out in a cottage in Quebec somewhere, not even knowing that she's supposed to be showing up for work to do like the one thing each year that we kind of expect the governor general to do. But uh, maybe, so maybe she'll be there. Maybe we won't. That's like the real, that's the real challenge for the odds makers. Does the governor general th show up for the throne speech on Wednesday, September 23rd? Just before we wrap things up here, this is a, a story that really made me shake my head, and I was quite ashamed that there wasn't a great deal of mainstream media attention to it at all. A British Columbia man with a violent history released from custody two days before allegedly assaulting children. 
The story is about Brian James Lamb, who's now facing two counts of assault, plus charges of mischief and assault with a weapon. Uh, A BC mother is livid and outraged, according to this CBC story, that this man who had a history of violence was released from custody just two days before assaulting her son and another boy, allegedly, at a park in uh, Okanagan, BC. And this is something that happens time and time again when people who are known to be risks of violence, people who are known to be risks to communities are released. And oftentimes the police will send out a media release to say, hey, you know, so-and-so has been released to the community and yeah, we think they're violent. And every time I would get one of them, I would always say, okay, well, why are we releasing them? And by the way, I'm not one of these people that says lock everyone away for life and throw away the key. I've actually had a profound evolution on on justice issues in the last several years, the more I look into them. But the one constant that should be there, no matter how liberal you are on justice, is that anyone who poses a threat to the community should not be released into the community. And this is a pretty fundamental hallmark of the justice system. At the very least, maybe you don't believe that prison's restorative. Maybe you don't believe that prison is something that can actually change people and make them better. Maybe you don't believe that it's a deterrent. But we can believe that having someone pulled out of the general population, if they are a threat to the general population, is a pretty good use of the prison system. But no, here we have someone who is released and cannot keep it together for two days before he assaults children, allegedly. And the RCMP described him, this is key, as a repeat offender and said in the week before the park incident, he had struck someone else with a baseball bat. Five days later, he caused a disturbance on the street where he held up traffic, threw items, screamed and tried to pick fights. Then he spat on an RCMP officer and resisted arrest. So, Perhaps these are not the behaviors of someone that we should be releasing out onto the street in the first place. And stories like these serve to undermine the justice system because they prove that it's completely not about justice. And it's sickening. Think of all the things that could have happened to children in this case. I mean, thank goodness we're not talking about someone who had a tendency or a desire to sexually assault children. And again, I I don't want to minimize what happened here in the sense that it was just physical assault. I don't want to say that. But I I am saying that it could have been a lot worse. and, And we can be grateful that it wasn't. But at the end of this, I'm looking and like, how can there be any faith, any confidence in the system when people that are known to be risks are released out and we're just supposed to say, oh, but you know what? They serve their time. Well, maybe the time itself is the problem that needs to be fixed. We've got to wrap things up. When we come back on the next show, we'll talk about the throne speech and all of the other things that have happened between now and then. My thanks to all of you for tuning into the show. We'll talk to you soon. This is the Andrew Lawton Show on True North. Thank you. God bless and good day, Canada. If you enjoy the show and want to hear more of it, we need your support. Head on over to andrewlawtonshow.com and click donate to support the work that we're doing and stand up for independent media. Thanks for listening to The Andrew Lawton Show. Support the program by donating to True North at www.tnc.news.